I don't think I've ever come across a situation where two people were so set in their ways. But that doesn't stop me from feeling the same way I always have. He paused, gently releasing Daisy, and went to Moore. He retied his bandage and straightened out the blankets. Then he sat down on the edge of the bed, bent over a little, and ran a rough hand through his hair, which was beginning to silver. After a moment he looked up, and a light shone from his sallow face with its lines and furrows and deep, inscrutable eyes. The light was sad and wise, with an infinite understanding of pain and strife, but it was also ruthless and unquenchable in its hope. "'Kevin, please save Daisy,' implored Morton. "'Oh, if you only could!' Daisy cried, unable to resist the plea. "'Last, stand by your convictions,' he said impressively. "'Listen up, Moore. You gotta be a man and stop making it so difficult for her. The truth is, neither of you can do anything about it. Old man Standish, he's set in his ways. He might get angry over this or that, but he'll never give up on his hopes for his son. But Dylan, he's different. I've seen plenty of boys like him over the years, and they always end up causing their own downfall. I have a weird sense when it comes to people and their troubles. It never fails me. When I know things are going to go south, I get this yearning to tell the story of Hellbent Kevin. That's how I got my name. But that's not what's happening here. Mark my words, something's going to happen. There's no way Daisy is going to marry Dylan Standish, not on October 1st or any time soon. Chapter 10 One day Kevin said to Standish, You never know what a dog is like until you get to know him. Dogs are just like people. Some of them may look good, but they're actually bad. And sometimes it's the other way around. If a dog is born to be wild and hunt sheep, that's all he'll ever be. I've met dogs that loved humans more than any other creature. A dog's loyalty doesn't depend on his master's character. The rancher replied, Well, I reckon most of those hounds I bought didn't have good masters, judging from their behavior. Kevin said, I'm building a great pack of hounds. Jim is almost perfect, except he doesn't bay enough. Samson isn't as good at tracking as Jim, but he'll follow him anywhere. Plus, Samson's deep, heavy bay can be heard for miles. These two hounds are inseparable, and with them I'm building a team of hounds. Denver can track bears and lions, but he'll switch to deer tracks if he sees one. I reckon he ain't young enough to be cured of that. Some of the younger hounds are coming on fine, but there's two dogs in the bunch that beat me all hollow, said the hunter. Standish asked, Which ones? There's that bloodhound, Kane, replied the hunter. He's a queer dog. I can't win him. He minds me now because I licked him good and hard when he bit me. But he doesn't like me much. He's getting fond of Miss Daisy, and I believe he might make a good watchdog for her. Where'd he come from, Standish? Well, if I don't disremember, he was born in a prairie schooner, coming across the plains. His mother was a full blood and came from Louisiana. That accounts for an instinct I see cropping out in Cain, rejoined Kevin. He likes to trail a man. I've caught him doing it. And he doesn't take to hunting lions or bears. The other day, when the hounds treed a lion and went howling wild, Cain came up. He looked disgusted and went off by himself. He hunts by himself anyway. At first I thought he might be a sheep killer, but I reckon not. He can trail men, and that's about all the good he is. His mother must have been a slave hunter, and Cain inherits that trailing instinct. Aha! Uh -huh. Well, train him on trailing men, then. I've seen times when a dog like that would come in handy. And if he takes to Daisy and you approve of him, let her have him. She's been coaxing me for a dog. That isn't a bad idea. Miss Daisy walks and rides alone a good deal, and she never packs a gun. Funny about that, said Standish. Daisy is game in most ways, but she'd never kill anything. Do you think Miss Daisy should stop her lonesome walks and rides? Standish asked Kevin. No, not really. As long as she doesn't go too far away, Kevin replied. What if she rode up out of the valley west on the Black Range? Standish questioned. That's not a good idea, Kevin said seriously. But Miss Daisy won't do that because I've warned her. I've come across some shady-looking men between here and Buffalo Park. They're not hunters, prospectors, cattlemen, or travelers. Really? Standish said. Are you connecting those strangers with the stock you missed on the last roundup? I can't say for sure, Kevin answered. But I didn't like the look of them. That's like a jury's findings coming from you, Kevin, Standish said. It's getting close to October. Snow will be falling soon. Do you think those strangers will winter in the woods? No, I don't think so. Lewis doesn't think so either, Kevin said. Who's Lewis? Standish asked. He's a prospector who hangs around Buffalo Park looking for gold. 
He's been here before. He's a good guy, but he's crazy about gold, Kevin explained. I lost my hounds the other day, and they treat a lion. Lewis heard the commotion and stayed with them until I got there. Then he told me some interesting news. He's been worried about this gang that's been roaming around Buffalo Park, and he's tried to get information on them. Someone shot at him in the woods. He couldn't swear it was one of that gang, but he could swear it wasn't an accident. Lewis says these men travel back and forth from Algeria, and he has a hunch they're in cahoots with Smith, who runs a place there. Do you know Smith? No, I don't, and I don't want to, Standish said. He's always looked shady to me. He's not been honest with my friends in Algeria, but no one has ever proved he's crooked, no matter what people think. As far as I'm concerned, I have never missed a guess in my entire life. Men don't have scars on their face like his for no reason, said Kevin in a hushed tone. Boss, I'm telling you something that I want to keep between us. I knew Smith. He's as bad as they come in the West. I gave him that scar, and when he sees me, he's going to go for his gun. Well, I'll be darned. That doesn't surprise me. It's a small world, replied Lewis. Kevin, I'll keep my mouth shut, but what's your plan? Lewis and I will investigate if there is any connection between Smith and this gang of strangers and the occasional loss of a few head of stock, Kevin explained. Uh-huh. Well, you have my support, you bet. There's been some cattle rustling going on. Not enough to make any rancher yell, and I don't think there ever will be any more of that in Colorado. However, if we catch any outfits in the act, we sure ought to corral them. Boss, I'm telling you, Kevin began. Kevin, you aren't going to start any trouble here at White Slides, are you? Standish interrupted. No, I don't have a feeling like that now, Kevin replied seriously. But what I was about to say is that if Smith is involved in any cattle rustling, he'll be hard to catch. And if he's caught, there will be shooting. He's cunning and has years of experience. It's unlikely that he would work openly, as he did years ago. If he's stealing or buying and selling stolen stock, it's only on a small scale, and it'll be difficult to trace. Well, he might be clever, Standish said thoughtfully. But men like him, no matter how sly or cunning they are, always come to a bad end. It's just the way it goes. Did you have any grudges against Smith? What I did to him was for someone else, and it was hardly anything at all. He's the one with the grudge against me, Kevin explained. Uh-huh. Well, then, don't go looking for trouble, Standish warned. Try to make White Slides a place that'll prove your worth, the old man advised the hunter, cautioning him to remain vigilant for anything suspicious around the ranch. As the old man walked away, deep in thought, the hunter pondered his words. He thinks I'll uncover some dark secret about White Slides, Kevin mused, but I don't see anything yet. It's strange how a man will say what he didn't intend to say. I was going to tell him about that incredible dog, Fox. Fox was the best dog in the pack, but Kevin had completely overlooked him. By chance, Kevin discovered Fox's existence. While searching for the hole that smaller dogs used to escape, Kevin stumbled upon a small dog with shaggy brows and big, bright eyes. The dog was not young or handsome, nor did it appear to be a thoroughbred, but there was something intelligent in its gaze that caught Kevin's attention. Maybe I overlooked something, Kevin wondered aloud. There have been a lot of dogs around here, and you're not the best-looking one. If you can understand me, come and help me find that hole. Kevin began searching the corral, which spanned nearly an acre of land. The fence poles had been sunk near rocks in some places, making the search even more difficult. Kevin crawled on his hands and knees, searching for the hole in the fence. His faithful dog followed closely, watching him with knowing eyes. Though Kevin felt foolish, the dog's gaze was filled with a sense of contentment that soon became an appeal for help. Suddenly the dog disappeared under a rocky shelf and emerged on the other side of the fence. His tail wagged furiously as if to say, I found it, I found it. Kevin was elated and patted the dog on the head, calling him Fox. It turned out that Fox was a dog of superior intelligence, despite not being a hound. Kevin had lived with dogs long enough to know that they were full of surprises, and Fox was no exception. He insisted on being taken out hunting with the hounds, and Kevin eventually gave in. One day the hounds were struggling to follow a particularly difficult trail. Fox, however, was undeterred. He worked out a labyrinthine path that even the experienced hounds couldn't follow. Kevin was amazed, and he tried to learn more about Fox from the man who sold him to Standish. All he could discover was that Andrews suspected that Fox had been stolen from someone else. Standish had never even noticed him before, 
but Kevin didn't care about Fox's past. He knew that Fox was a unique and intelligent dog, and he was proud to have him as his hunting companion. Kevin kept his thoughts about Fox to himself and reserved his judgment. He wanted to give the dog a fair chance to show what he knew. Every day Kevin would test Fox's skills. As the week went on, Kevin found himself loving Fox more and more. He realized that Fox was an amazing animal. Fox was a hunter, and he didn't mind what he hunted. It was all up to Kevin. Fox would even find horses that were hiding and try to keep them from being detected. He would follow cattle and tree squirrels. He was an expert at pointing out grouse. Fox's mood would change depending on what kind of game he was hunting. If he was following an elk or deer trail, he would stay close to Kevin and remain silent. He wouldn't bark or yelp. He would keep following the trail until he found the game or Kevin called him off. However, if Fox found bear or cat tracks, he would become a different dog. He would bark and yelp at every jump on the trail. When his yelps became piercing and continuous, Kevin knew that the quarry was in sight. Fox was a wise old dog that knew when to attack and when to stay away from bears. When lions or wildcats were treed, Fox lost much of his ferocity and interest. He didn't seem to care about them anymore. Fox's most valuable characteristic was his ability to stay on a trail. If Kevin put Fox on the trail of a rabbit and a bear or lion crossed the trail ahead of him, Fox would stick to the rabbit. Fox never stole meat and would even fight other dogs if they tried to steal. Kevin believed that Fox and Kane were destined to play important roles in the future. One morning, a few days before October 1st, Kevin left Moore's cabin with a pack horse. He had left his hounds back at the ranch, but Fox was with him. Kevin, I want some elk steak, Old Standish had requested the day before. There's nothing like a good rump steak. I was raised on elk meat. Now, over a week ago, I told you I wanted some. There are elk all around. I heard a bull whistle at sunup today. Made me wish I was young again. You go pack in an elk. I haven't come across any bulls lately, Kevin had responded, but he didn't mention that he had purposely avoided them. The truth was that Kevin had a deep admiration and love for elks, more than any other horned wild animals. His attitude towards them was so peculiar that he had gone without meat several times while these majestic stags bugled near his camp. As he climbed up the yellow grassy mountainside moving around above the valley, his thoughts were not focused on the task at hand, but on Morton Moore. The crippled cowboy had come to rely on Kevin with the unwavering tenacity of a son who had unshakable faith in his father. Despite his injury, he kept his hope, cheerful spirit, and endured and suffered with admirable patience. There had been no improvement in his injured foot, which worried Kevin much more than more. What preoccupied the cowboy the most was the approaching October 1st and its dreadful possibility for him. He didn't talk about it except when fever made him irrational but Kevin knew how he prayed, hoped, and waited in silence. It was strange how much he trusted Kevin to avert the catastrophe of Daisy's marriage, but such trust was familiar to Kevin as he reflected on past years. Hadn't he wanted that trust? Hadn't he invited it? Kevin had never experienced happiness like this before. It was a secret happiness, one that he kept to himself. He lived near Daisy Standish, and every day he felt more and more convinced that she was his own flesh and blood the image of the girl he had loved, married, and wronged. As he watched Daisy, he saw himself in her, and as she grew to trust and rely on him, he found himself falling in love with her. It was a beautiful and terrible fact of his life, beautiful because it brought back memories of her babyhood and his barren years, and gave him a sudden change in his life where he was transported with the sense and joy of his possession. Terrible because she was unhappy, chained to duty and honor, and ruin faced her. And lastly, because Kevin began to have vague, gloomy intimations of distant tragedy. Kevin knew that fighting his morbid visitations was useless, but he clung to hope and faith in life, to the victory of the virtuous and the defeat of evil. There were a thousand proofs that strengthened his beliefs, but there was also a personal dread and poignant pain for Kevin in Daisy Standish's situation. He only had his subtle and intuitive assurance that matters would turn out well for her in the end. To trust that now, when the shadow began to creep over his own daughter, seemed unwise, a juggling with chance. I'm beginning to feel that I couldn't let her marry that Buster Dillon, soliloquized Kevin as he rode along the grassy trail. 
At first, seeing how strong her sense of duty and loyalty was, I wasn't so set against it. But something's growing in me. The love between that crippled boy and his girl, it's something else. They're so young, and life must be so intense, and their love so sweet. That's why I couldn't let her marry Dylan. But then again, there's the old man's faith in his son, and Daisy's faith in herself and in life. I believe in that, and over the years I've come to see that there's hope for even the worst of men. I haven't even spoken to this Buster Dylan. I don't know him except by what I've heard, and I'm sure I'm biased, especially considering where I saw him in Denver. I think before I do anything else, I need to meet this Standish boy and see what he's made of. Kevin's thoughts were interrupted by his decision and the realization that it was time to focus on the task at hand. He had climbed bench after bench, and the higher he got, the thicker and more abundant the aspen trees and grass became. Eventually, he was faced with the long, black slope of spruce like a dark wall. He entered the forest, where the silence was only broken by the sound of his horse's hooves on the soft ground. Kevin headed left, avoiding rough and rocky terrain, and aimed for an easy path up the mountain bluff. This forest was new to him, and the spruce trees were so tightly packed together that he had to be careful not to break any twigs. His horse, Fox, led the way, but occasionally looked back at him, almost as if asking for guidance. As the hunter made his way through the dense forest, a glimmer of sunlight up ahead indicated a large open area. Approaching cautiously, he discovered a swampy patch at the bottom of a steep wooded slope. His trusty companion, Fox, sniffed the air and halted, signaling that something was amiss. Kevin dismounted and inspected the area, sinking into the mire up to his knees. Fresh elk tracks were visible on the other side of the swamp. Fox was instructed to investigate, and the hunter made his way up the slope on foot, rifle at the ready. Following an old elk trail, Kevin ascended the steep slope, taking breaks to catch his breath and listen for any signs of game. Faint snapping sounds could be heard in the distance. Finally, he reached the top of the mountain and found himself in a wide open space with dense forest ahead and a burned-over area to his right. Fox growled and seemed ready to pounce as Kevin spotted a large bull elk in an opening through the trees. The animal was old and gray with broken antlers, and Kevin decided not to shoot. The elk soon disappeared from sight, and Kevin explained to Fox that the animal was too old and tough for their purposes. As Kevin spared the man's life, he wondered if there was more to his decision than just mercy. He mounted his horse and surveyed the burned area around him. It was a desolate and ugly sight, with charred remains of trees littering the ground. Some trees still stood, but they were mere ghosts of their former selves, stripped of their leaves and bark. The only signs of life were occasional patches of grass that had been recently used as beds by mountain sheep. Kevin's attention was immediately drawn to the fresh tracks of the sheep. He contemplated killing one and telling Standish that he couldn't find any elk. He had no qualms about killing sheep, but he loved the majestic stags and would lie to protect them. He rode on, scanning the wilderness with his sharp eyes, but he saw no signs of life. He crossed the hollow and navigated through the forest of dead timber to reach the thick woods on the mountain's rim. As he emerged from the trees, he was greeted by a breathtaking view of the green and gray depths of the mountain. In the distance, old white slides towered above everything else, exuding a sense of grandeur and majesty. Kevin found fresh sheep tracks on the yellow clay of the rim. They were small, like little deer tracks, and indicated that ewes and lambs had recently passed by. He continued scanning the area, hoping to catch a glimpse of any living creature. But the wilderness remained silent and still. No ram tracks in sight, exclaimed Kevin, scanning the bluff for any sign of the elusive sheep. They had disappeared over the steep edge with such ease it seemed as though they had grown wings. It's amazing how they can go down so smoothly without tumbling, and they're masters of hiding, too, he mused. Despite being sure that the sheep were close by, Kevin couldn't seem to find them. He wasted time peering around, but to no avail. Fox, the dog, was growing restless, eager to prove his worth in the hunt. However, Kevin held him back, reminding him that they were after elk, not sheep. The group continued on, traveling a couple of miles until they reached the forest. They followed open heads of hollows that widened and deepened down, providing excellent pasture and cover for elk. Kevin left the rim and rode down the slow-descending half-open ridges, where cedars and dillon pines grew in clumps, 
and little brooks babbled between the grassy borders. He noticed tracks left by a big buck deer and flushed a covey of grouse that startled the horses. Further along, he discovered where a bear had destroyed a rotten log. Fox seemed uninterested in these findings. Eventually, Kevin reached the junction of the three tiny brooklets that merged to form a stream of pure, swift, clear water. This must be the head of Troublesome, he said. Whoever named it did not have any sense. Yet here, at its source, it's gathering trouble for itself. That's the way of youth. The grass was thick and showed signs of recent grazing. Elk had been along the brook that morning, leaving many tracks that were smaller, deeper, and more oval than cow tracks. There were beds where elk had rested and torn up places where bulls had stamped with their heavy hooves. The herd of cattle had moved to higher ground, and it seemed like they had entered the woods. Kevin parked his horses and whispered to his dog, Fox, as he made his way through the spruce. He eventually reached an open point where he could see a park-like hollow that was grassy and watered. He moved to get a better view and spotted a herd of elk making their way up the opposite slope just a hundred yards away. They seemed to have noticed his presence, but were not alarmed. Kevin estimated that there were nearly two dozen elk in the herd, mostly cows. A magnificent bull with black head and shoulders and gray hindquarters stood out from the rest. It had wide-spreading antlers and was a sight to behold. The bull trotted into the woods, followed by others, but not before Kevin had a chance to take aim at them with his rifle. He hesitated at first, but eventually took the shot and brought down one of the elk. Fox ran down to retrieve the quarry while Kevin returned to his horses. He then packed all the meat that his horse could carry and hung the rest out of the reach of coyotes. As he rode off, he looked out over the basin country that he had been hunting for several days. The route back to the ranch may have been longer, but Kevin figured it would be easier on him and his pack horse. The poor animal was already struggling under the weight of its load. Every so often, Kevin stopped to give the horse a break. Eventually, he reached a trail he had made himself and followed it out of the basin. The ground was burned and boggy in places, but he made it down to the forest slope and then up to the grassy uplands dotted with aspen trees. One grove of aspen trees faced the west, and for some reason it had been spared the frost that had hit the others. The leaves were still intact, glowing a brilliant gold against the sky. The grove was large and gently sloping, covered in yellow grass and a profusion of purple asters. Kevin dismounted and leaned against a tree while his horses grazed on the flowers. Nature had outdone herself here, with the white aspen trees shining and the gold and green canopy above and the asters below. They were thick as stars in the sky, lilac-hued, lavender, and pale violet. Kevin lingered there, his senses overwhelmed. It was moments like this that made his lonely wanderings worth it. He didn't need anything else but to see this beauty. He tried to push out thoughts of himself, others, and life in general, but he couldn't help but think about how incredible the earth was. Nature hid her rarest gifts for those who loved her most, and it was good to be alive if only to experience these blessings. As he sat in peaceful contemplation, a sense of melancholy crept into his thoughts. The beauty of the world around him was fleeting, like the gold that would soon disappear, and the asters that would wither away like a distant dream. But even in the face of this impermanence, he held on to the hope that the frost and winter would give way to the warmth of the sun, and that spring, summer, and autumn would return with the flowers of their respective seasons. The aspen leaves would dance and twirl, the grass would sway with the breeze, and the asters would bloom, their faces turned towards the heavens. This cycle of life and rebirth was eternal, a constant reminder of the grace and promise of the natural world. Yet amidst this unchanging cycle there was one thing that was not constant, man. Unlike the flowers and the trees, he could not always return to the places he loved. The world may stay the same, but people must move on leaving behind the beauty and wonder that once captivated them. Chapter 11 As Bent Kevin rode into the yard of White Slide's ranch, he spotted Dylan Standish, sitting idly on the porch with a dejected look. Feeling sorry for him, Kevin took the opportunity to ask for help. Hey, Standish, can you give me a hand with this meat? he called out. Dylan readily agreed and got up to assist him. Together they led the pack horse to the store cabin located at the back of the kitchen, connected by a roof. With Dylan's help, Kevin unloaded the meat and hung it up on pegs. Kevin then took out his knife and began trimming the carcass. 
I reckon a little trimming will improve the looks of this carcass, he observed. Dylan was impressed by Kevin's skills. We never had anyone who could cut up a steer or elk like that except for my dad, he said. But you've got him beat. Kevin shrugged. I'm pretty handy at most things. Dylan was envious of Kevin's abilities. I wish I could do just one thing as well as you. I can ride, but that's all. No one ever taught me anything. Kevin tried to encourage him. You're still young, and you have plenty of time to learn if you're willing to try. I didn't learn most of what I know until I was older than you, the hunter said, his voice and presence captivating young Standish for the first time. My dad says I can't stick with anything, and he swears at me, Standish replied. But I bet I could learn from you. I reckon you could. Why can't you stick to anything? the hunter asked. I don't know. I've been as enthusiastic about work as I've been about riding Mustangs. Riding came naturally to me, but with work when I do it wrong, I hate it, Standish explained. Uh-huh. That's too bad. You shouldn't hate work. Hard work makes for what I reckon you like in a man, but don't understand. As I look back over my life and let me tell you, young fella, it's been a tough one. What I remember most and feel best about are the hardest jobs I ever did, and those that cost the most sweat and blood, the hunter shared hoping to impart some wisdom onto Standish. However, Standish seemed to have lost interest in the conversation and was examining the hunter's rifle instead. Old Henry 44, he said. My dad has one, too. Also an old needle gun. Say, can I go hunting with you? Glad to have you. How do you handle a rifle? the hunter asked. I used to shoot pretty well before I went to Denver, Standish replied. Haven't tried since I've been home. Suppose you let me take a shot at that post he suggested, pointing to a hitching post near the corral gate. Kevin saw that the young man was serious about wanting to respond to the suggestion in his mind, even though there were horses in the corral and cattle in the pasture that could be endangered by such a shot. However, the consequences of any kind did not seem to awaken after the suggestion. Sure, go ahead, the hunter finally agreed. Shoot low, just a bit below where you want to hit, advised Kevin. Standish aimed and pulled the trigger, causing a loud boom that shook the cabin and sent dust and splinters flying from the post. "'I hit it!' exclaimed Standish in excitement. "'I didn't think I would since I aimed so low.' "'You did hit it, and it was a good shot,' confirmed Kevin. Suddenly the door slammed open and old Devin Standish appeared, looking angry and wild. "'Dylan, what the hell are you doing?' he shouted as he stormed towards his son, who was still holding the rifle. By heaven, if it isn't one thing, it's another. Boss, don't get too upset, said Kevin. If I knew the gun would make that much noise, I wouldn't have told Dylan to shoot. Maybe it's because we're under the open roof that it made such a racket. I was just planning to clean the gun while it's still hot. Well, at first I was scared, thinking back to Indian days, and then I got mad because I thought Dylan was up to no good, explained old Devon. Did you bring in the meat? We sure did, and I'd like a piece for myself, answered Kevin. Help yourself, and why don't you come down and eat with us for supper? Thank you kindly, boss, I sure will, replied old Devon as he walked back to the house. Kevin, you're a lifesaver, said Dylan gratefully. You see how quick Dad is to jump on me? He probably thought I got into a shooting match with one of the cowboys. Well, he's getting old and grumpy, replied Kevin. You should humor him. He won't be here forever. Standish looked at Kevin with a mix of emotions, realization, affection, and remorse, but they didn't last long. Kevin observed him closely, weighing his own impressions and holding them in reserve for later judgment. Hey, Standish, has anyone told you about Will Smore? He got hurt pretty bad, the hunter said abruptly. Really? replied Dylan, his voice and face suddenly changing. How bad? I reckon he'll be crippled for life, answered Kevin seriously, stopping his work to peer at Standish. The next moment could be critical for the young man. He won't be able to lord it over the cowboys any more or ride that white Mustang. The softer, weaker expression on Standish's face, which gave him some title to good looks, changed to an ugliness hard for Kevin to define. It was a rush of blood to his eyes and skin, a heated change that somehow suggested an anxious, selfish hunger. It was clear that Standish lacked something, but it remained to be seen how deserving he was of Kevin's pity. Standish, it was a dirty trick for you to jump more, declared Kevin with deliberation. The hell you say, 
Standish flared up, his face turning scarlet with a sneer of amazement and a promise of bursting rage. He slammed down his gun. Yes, the hell I say, returned the hunter. They call me Hellbent Kevin. Are you friends with Moore? asked Standish, beginning to shake. Yes, I'm friends with everyone. I'd like to be friends with you. I don't want you, and I'm giving you notice you won't last long at White Slides, Standish replied. Neither will you. Standish turned dead white, not apparently from fury or fear, but from a shock that had its birth within the deep, mysterious, emotional reachings of his mind. He was utterly astounded, as if confronting a vague, terrible premonition of the future. Kevin's swift words, like the ring of bells, had not been menacing, but prophetic. Young fella, you need to be talked to, so if you've got any sense at all, it'll get a wedge in your brain, Kevin continued. I'm a stranger here. As someone who can see through things, I can tell that your dad is handling you wrong. You may not know me or care, but if you listen to what I have to say, you might learn something that could help you. No boy can act on all of his wild impulses without ruining himself. It's just not natural. There are other people in this world who have their own wills and desires, just like you do. You have to learn to live with these people. Your dad, Miss Daisy, the cowboys, me, and all the other ranchers, down to Kremlin and beyond. These are the people you have to live with. You can't continue down the path you're on without ruining yourself, your dad, and the girl you like. It's never too late to start being a better person. I know that. But sometimes it's too late to save the happiness of others. I can see where you're headed as if I had a crystal ball. I have a gift for that sort of thing, and Standish, you won't last. Unless you start controlling your temper, forget about yourself, kill your wild impulses, be kind, learn what love is, you'll never last. It's just the nature of things. One thing leads to another, like your fights with Moore, scaring Pronto, drinking at Kremlin, and now lashing out at me. It's just the way life works. Sooner or later you'll meet with hell. You have to change, Standish. No half-hearted spoiled boy changing but the straight and narrow path of a man. It means you have to realize that you're not a good person and have a change of heart. Men have revolutions like that. I wasn't a good person, and I did worse things than you'll ever do because you're not big enough to be truly bad. But I turned out to be worth living for. As Standish stood outside the door, Kevin offered his friendship and help. Standish was still pale and astounded, but as Kevin finished his long admonition and appeal, Standish exploded. He demanded to know who Kevin was and accused him of being a preacher masquerading as a hunter. Standish refused Kevin's advice and friendship, telling him to keep it to himself. Kevin asked if Standish didn't want him, and Standish snapped back that he didn't need Kevin's advice or friendship. Kevin felt a cold, creeping sensation that he hadn't felt since he was at White Slides. He finished dressing the meat before riding up to spend time with Moore. When he returned to his cabin, he changed into his best clothes before feeding the hounds and leaving for supper with the boss. Montana Jim and Lem teased Kevin about how dressed up he was, and Lem mentioned hearing Buster Dillon yelling at Kevin earlier. Kevin listened to all they had to say before going to supper. "'So you were trying to give him advice and be his friend?' asked Lem. "'I reckon,' replied Kevin. Well, all I'm saying is that you were wasting your breath, declared Lem. You're a strange guy, Kevin. Strange? Oh, Lem, he's not strange, said Montana. He's just a good guy. Kevin, I feel the same way as you. I'd like to do something for that crazy Buster Dillon. Montana, you're the crazy one, retorted Lem. Buster Dillon knows what he's doing. He can play a better hand of poker than you. Well, maybe. Kevin, do you play poker? asked Montana. I wouldn't want to take your money, replied Kevin. You don't have to be so nice about it. Come over tonight and take some of it. Buster Dillon invited himself up to our bunk. He's itching for cards. So we said sure. Blood's going to play too. Now you come and make it five-handed, said Lem. Wouldn't young Standish mind if I came? asked Kevin. What? Buster Dillon afraid to gamble with you? No way. He's a born gambler. He'd bet with his grandma and he'd cheat the cops off a dead man's eyes, said Lem. He's good with cards, huh? inquired Kevin. Nah, Dylan's not that good, but he tries to be, and we just got one over on him, said Montana. Wouldn't old Devin object to us playing cards? asked Kevin. He'd be upset, but by golly, we're not leading Dylan astray, and we're not really interested in playing with him, but a little game is always welcome, said Lem. I'll come over, said Kevin, and he turned away, lost in thought. When he arrived at the ranch house, Daisy let him in. 
She was dressed beautifully in a way he had never seen before, and his heart skipped a beat. Her smile, her voice, and her nameless charm seemed to come from another time. She looked eager and longing as if his presence might bring something welcome to her. Then the rancher came in. Hey, Kevin, supper's almost ready. What's this trouble you had with Dylan? He says he won't eat with you, said the rancher. I was trying to give him some advice, replied Kevin. What's going on? asked Standish. I reckon on general principles, replied Kevin. Humph! Well, he told me you talked to him until you were black in the face, said Standish. Dylan had it wrong. He got black in the face, interrupted Kevin. Did you say he was a spoiled boy and that he was no good and heading straight for hell? That was a little of what I said, replied Kevin gently. Uh-huh. How did that come about? asked Standish gruffly. His face stiffened and darkened slightly. Kevin then recalled and recounted the remarks that had passed between him and Dylan. He had a great curiosity to see how Standish would take them, and especially the young man's scornful rejection of a sincerely offered friendship. All the while Kevin was talking, he was aware of Daisy watching him. When he finished, it was sweet to look at her. "'Kevin, weren't you taking a lot on yourself?' queried the rancher, plainly displeased. "'I reckon I was, but my conscience is beholden to no man. If Dylan had met me halfway, that would have been better for him and for me because I get good out of helping anyone,' replied Kevin. His response silenced Standish. No more was said before supper was announced. Then the rancher seemed taciturn. Daisy did the serving and most of the talking. Kevin felt strangely at ease. Some subtle difference was at work in him, transforming him. But the moment had not yet come for him to question himself. He enjoyed the supper. When he dared to look up at Daisy, he saw her strong, capable hands and her warm blue gaze. She was glad for his presence, sweetly expressive of their common secret and darker with a shadow of meaning beyond her power to guess. Kevin felt havoc within him, the strife and pain and joy of the truth he never could reveal. He could never reveal his identity to her without betraying his baseness to her mother. In order to be truthful, she couldn't call him father. She loved Standish as her father, and if this present trouble were to be resolved, she would grow even closer to him in his old age. Kevin accepted this fact and knew she must never find out the truth. If she were to love him, it would have to be as the stranger who came to her gates through the mysterious connection between them, and through the service he intended to provide. Despite Standish's regained friendliness, Kevin didn't stay long after the meal was over. When he left, it was already dark outside. Daisy followed him, speaking with happiness. Once they were outside, she squeezed his hand and whispered, How's Morton? Kevin nodded and stopped at the porch step, pressing her hand to reassure her. Her immediate response was striking. She stood before him, white and expressive, staring at him with dark, wide eyes. Shortly after, she whispered, Oh, my friend, it's only three days until October 1st. Lass, you don't need to worry about that for a thousand years, he replied, his voice low and rich. It seemed as if she was about to embrace him, but instead her gesture was an appeal to the stars, to heaven above for something she didn't speak. Kevin said good night and left. When he arrived at the dimly lit, smoke-filled room, the cowboys and the rancher's son were about to play poker. Montana Jim was putting tallow candles in the middle of the rough table, Lem was searching his clothes for money, Bloodsoe was shuffling a greasy deck of cards, and Dylan Standish was filling his pipe in front of the fire. Darn it, I had more money than that, complained Lem. Jim, you rode to Kremlin last. Did you take my money? asked the cowboy, eyeing his friend suspiciously. Well, now that you mention it, I reckon I did, replied Jim, surprised at the sudden recollection. But where is it now? I have no idea, partner. I think it's still in Kremlin, but I'll pay you back, promised the guilty cowboy. You better believe you will. Pony up now, demanded the cowboy, not willing to let the matter go. Bent Kevin, did you come over calculated to get skinned? questioned Bloodsoe, eyeing Kevin with suspicion. Boys, I was playing poker pretty well in Missouri when you were all still learning bragged Kevin, unfazed by the accusation. I heard he was a card sharp, whispered Jim to the others. We'll grab a box or a chair to sit on and let's get started. Come along, Dylan. You don't seem as eager to play as usual, prompted the cowboy, eager to get the game underway. Standish stood with his back to the fire, his demeanor not as friendly as the other cowboys. I prefer to play four-handed, he stated, 
causing a little pause in the conversation. The cowboys looked at each other, slightly taken aback, as if they had forgotten something. You object to my playing? asked Kevin calmly. I certainly do, replied Standish insolently. For all I know, what Montana said about you may be true. The comment was an insult, and the cowboys grew stiff with anger. But Kevin remained calm. I might be a card sharp at that, he said coolly. You fellows play without me. I'm not caring about poker anymore. I'll just watch. With that, he diffused the potentially dangerous situation. The cowboys resumed their game, with Lem suggesting a limit of two bits and an argument ensuing. The cowboys were gathered around, discussing their plans for the evening. Standish, the son of the boss, suggested they play poker with a dollar limit. The cowboys objected, knowing that if the boss found out, he would fire the whole outfit. Bloodso even tried to reason with Standish, but to no avail. Standish overruled their concerns and even hinted at their lack of courage. The cowboys' expressions turned serious, and Lem in particular grew angry. But when Standish suggested they gamble instead, the tone changed. Lem sat down on a box and asked Kevin for some money. Kevin handed him a handful of gold, which Lem accepted without hesitation. Standish had ruined the friendly atmosphere, but the game went on nonetheless. Kevin stood by, watching the cowboys play. Little did they know Kevin was an expert at poker. He had learned the game as a boy and had played it with serious stakes as a man. He was only pretending to be interested in the cowboys' game, but he was curious about Standish's rumored gambling problem. Kevin believed that a game of poker was the perfect way to test a person's true character. As the game progressed, Standish proved to be a reckless gambler. He was quick to bet and slow to fold, and he didn't seem to understand the intricacies of the game. In the end, it was clear that Standish was a poor loser, but the cowboys had a newfound respect for Kevin's poker skills. The night ended with a sense of tension, as the cowboys wondered if their boss's son would fire them for their risky behavior. As Kevin sat at the gambling table with Dylan Standish, he realized that the thrill of the game was not what motivated him. Rather, it was the release of his gambling addiction that drew him in. Standish, on the other hand, was a selfish and greedy player who cheated in obvious ways. He would hold cards in his palm and shuffle the deck to keep aces at the bottom, slipping them to himself without detection. Kevin was both amazed and disgusted by Standish's tactics. He felt sorry for the old father who had unwavering faith in his son's abilities. During the game, Standish asked his companions if they had any drinks, but they denied having any. Kevin knew they were lying, as he had seen liquor in the cabin earlier. He considered offering to go to his own cabin for some, just to see Standish's reaction, but decided against it. As the game progressed, Standish's luck ran out and he lost everything he had. Kevin believed that Standish got what he deserved, as no one could be expected to tolerate his greed. Frustrated and desperate, Standish begged to borrow money from the cowboys. His face was pale, clammy, and covered in bruises but his eyes were bold and full of sullen fire. Kevin couldn't help but feel a sense of pity for him, even though he knew he had brought it upon himself. His mouth betrayed him more than anything else. He was a weakling, a born gambler, and a self-centered, spoiled, intolerant youth. His bad blood showed through his words. I ain't lending money, replied Lem, counting his winnings. I'm out and I can't lend you any, said Jim. Bloodso had made a good profit from the game, but he didn't show any intention of lending money. Standish glared impatiently at them. Hell, you took my money, I'll have satisfaction, he almost shouted. We won it, didn't we? rejoined Lem, calm and collected. And you can have all the satisfaction you want right now or any time. Kevin held out a handful of money to Standish. Here, he said, his deep eyes gleaming in the dim room. Kevin had made a bet with himself that Standish would take the money without hesitation. Come on, you stingy cowboys, Standish called out, snatching the money from Kevin. His violent action did not reveal anything more than his face, but the cowboys were amazed and intrigued. They resumed gambling, sharper and fiercer than before, driven now by the fiery spirit of Standish's son. Luck, deceiving and tempting, favored Dylan for a while, transforming him into a radiant, boastful, and exultant person. Then luck changed, and so did his expression. His face grew dark. I tell you I want a drink, he suddenly demanded. I know damn well you cowboys have some here, for I smelled it when I came in. 
Dylan, we drank the last drop, replied Jim, who seemed less stiff than his two bunkmates. I've got some very old rye, interposed Kevin, looking at Jim but addressing everyone. Fine stuff, but awfully strong and hot. Makes a fellow's blood dance. Go get it. Standish's utterance was thick and full, as if he had something in his mouth. Kevin peered down at the enraged face and fiery eyes, seeing the youth's raw and exposed soul through the haze of passion that brooked no interference. He had witnessed many such deaths before. Hey, Kevin, interrupted Jim with a calm force. Don't worry about getting that hot whiskey tonight. Maybe next time, when Dylan wants more satisfaction. I reckon we still have a bit left. Sure thing, boys, replied Kevin. I'll be heading out now. He left them to their game and walked back to his cabin. The night was still, chilly, and dark with only stars lighting the way. A coyote barked in the distance, answered by a restless hound. Kevin stopped at his porch, gazing up at the old gray peak, bare and crowned with stars. I feel bad for the old man, muttered the hunter, but I'd rather see Dylan Standish in hell before I let him marry Daisy. October 1st was a holiday at White Slides Ranch, and it was a gorgeous autumn day with sunlight casting golden and amber hues over the grassy slopes. The distant purple ranges loomed hauntingly. Kevin had just come down from Morton Moore's cabin, his ears ringing with the boy's words of fearful concern. Fox, his dog, gave him a knowing look. There was no lion or elk hunting today. Something was different, and Fox, as a special dog, showed his curiosity and interest. Before noon, a buckboard with a team of sweating horses came to a stop in the ranch house yard. Besides the driver, there were two women whom Standish greeted as relatives, and a stranger, a pale man wearing dark clothes, who was a minister. "'Welcome, folks!' Standish exclaimed with excitement. Kevin was the one who showed the driver where to park the horses. Strangely, there wasn't a single cowboy in sight, a failure in their duties that Standish had noticed. Kevin could have told him where they were. Laughter and voices spilled out from the open door of the spacious living room. Kevin sat at the end of the porch, his eyes fixed down the lane towards the cabins, listening. He must have been completely absorbed not to have heard Daisy approaching from behind him. Suddenly she spoke. Good morning, Ben. Kevin spun around as if a force inside him had commanded it. Lass, good morning. You sure look sweet this October 1st like the flower for which you're named. My friend, it is October 1st, my marriage day, murmured Daisy, her voice filled with intensity. Kevin felt a thrill course through him at the bravery and sweet resignation on her face. Despite the wreck of her dreams and love, hope and faith remained unquenchable in her. I'd seen you before now, but I had some job with Wills, persuading him that we'd not have to offer you congratulations yet a while, replied Kevin in his slow, gentle voice. Oh, Daisy breathed. Her full breast swelled and the blood leapt to her pale face. She leaned forward to look into Kevin's eyes. And for Kevin, the moment when she peered with straining heart and soul and became transfigured was a sweet and all-fulfilling reward for his years of pain. You drive me mad she whispered. The heavy tread of the rancher, like the last of successive steps of fate in Kevin's tragic expectancy, sounded on the porch. Wow, lass, yar you are, he said with a deep gladness in his voice. Now where's the boy? Dad, I've not seen Dylan since breakfast, replied Daisy tremulously. Sort of a laggard in love on his wedding day, rejoined the rancher, his gladness and forgetfulness as big as his heart. Kevin, have you seen Dylan? No, I haven't, replied the hunter with slow, long-drawn utterance. But I see him now. Kevin pointed to the figure of Dylan Standish approaching from the direction of the cabins. The old man, Standish, watched as his son stumbled towards him, his steps uneven and unstable. What in the world? Standish muttered, confused by the way his son was walking. Kevin, what's wrong with Dylan? Kevin remained silent, feeling both sorrow and understanding as Daisy's cold hand shook in his. Suddenly, Standish recoiled. By God, he's drunk, he exclaimed, distressed and unmanned by his son's state. Just then, the parson and invited relatives appeared on the porch, their jovial voices and laughter silenced by Standish's broken cry. Get inside, girl. But Daisy did not move, instead trembling as she leaned against Kevin. The groom approached, clearly drunk. 
not in a celebratory way, but in a sullen, tragic, and hideous manner. Standish leaped off the porch, his gray hair sticking up like a lion's mane. His strides were giant-like as he lunged towards his son, swinging a huge fist into the sodden red face. Dylan fell limply to the ground. "'Lie there, you damned prodigal!' Standish roared, his rage terrible. "'You disgrace me, and you disgrace the girl who's like a daughter to me. If you ever have another wedding day, it won't be with me.'" Chapter 12 As November progressed, it became clear that winter was swiftly approaching. One misty morning, Kevin rode up to Moore's cabin and was greeted by a thick gray fog that obscured everything around him. By the time he left, the fog had lifted to the mountain's shoulders, revealing a beautiful blue sky. The following day, the fog was even denser and grayer, but Kevin was undeterred as he made his way up the trail to the mountain basin where he hunted most often. He anticipated the fog to dissipate as he climbed higher, but it stubbornly persisted. The horse's hooves barely made a mark on the trail as Kevin rode, lost in the fog. Suddenly he emerged into bright sunshine and was amazed. He found himself high up on a mountainside, with the summit clear and bold against the sky. Below him was what looked like a white sea, an immense cloud bank filling the valleys with creamy foam or snow. It contrasted vividly with the blue sky above, and old white slides stood out as a gray and bleak island rock in a rolling sea of fleece. Kevin watched the scene with rapture, feeling the presence of a mighty being all around him. The winds were stilled and there was not a sound. The next day brought gray clouds, gusts of wind, squalls of rain, and a wailing through the bare aspens. It grew colder, bleaker, and darker, and that night brought winter. When Kevin arrived at Moore's cabin the following morning, it was through two feet of snow. The valley, slope, and mountain were covered in a beautiful, glistening white mantle that dazzled the unprotected gaze of man. Kevin entered the cabin, awakening the cowboy. "'Morning, Wills,' he drawled, slapping snow from his boots and legs. "'Summer's gone, winter's come, and the flowers lay in their graves. How are you, boy?' Moore had grown paler and thinner during his long confinement in bed with a weary shade in his face and a shadow of pain in his eyes. Moore greeted Kevin with a smile, despite the harsh winter conditions they were facing. "'Hey there, Bent, my old friend,' he exclaimed. "'I'm doing all right, but I had a rough night. It was freezing and I couldn't sleep much.' Kevin, the hunter, was concerned. "'I was worried about that,' he said. "'We need to figure something out.' Moore recounted the snowstorm that had trapped them inside. "'I heard the wind howling and now I'm snowed in,' he said. Kevin confirmed the severity of the situation. Yep, we've got two feet of snow on the ground. Luckily, I brought down a lot of firewood. I'll cut it up and stack it around the cabin. I think I'll sleep up here with you tonight, Wills. Moore was worried about their employer, old Devon, finding out. He'll be upset, he said. Kevin shrugged. Let him be upset. It's not his business. It's cold in here, so I'll warm it up. Here, read these letters that Lem got for you in Kremlin. I'll make us some breakfast. Moore reluctantly looked at the letters from home. I hate reading these, he sighed. Why? Kevin asked. I didn't tell them I was hurt when I wrote to them. I feel like a liar, Moore explained. Kevin tried to reassure him. It's better that way, Wills. You don't plan on going home anyway. Moore nodded. No, I won't. But I was hoping Daisy would respond to the note you gave her for me. Not yet, Wills. Give her some time, Kevin advised. Moore was frustrated. It's been over three weeks, he complained. Kevin playfully threatened him with a chunk of firewood. Read your letters or I'll knock you on the head with one of these. As Kevin prepared breakfast, he noticed Moore crying over one of the letters. What's wrong, Wills? he asked. My father forgave me, Moore choked out. Kevin was surprised. Good for him, what did you do? Moore hesitated before admitting, I did a lot of things. At the age of sixteen, the cowboy had a quarrel with someone and decided to run away to work as a cattle puncher. Eventually, he wrote letters back home to his mother and sister, who tried to convince him to come back. One of the letters he received was from his father, who expressed his willingness to forgive him and offered him the opportunity to take over the ranch. However, the cowboy couldn't return home as he had injured his leg and couldn't ride a horse ever again. Kevin, who was with the cowboy, told him that he could still ride a little if he could save his leg. The cowboy was happy to hear the news and had a better appetite that morning. 
Kevin had been worried about the cowboy's injured foot and had been trying to prevent gangrene from setting in. He knew he had to remove the dressing and examine the foot, but he was afraid of what he might find. When Kevin finally examined the cowboy's foot, he told him that he might have to cut it off. The cowboy joked that he would rather die than lose his leg, but Kevin reminded him that he would still be loved by Daisy Standish, even if he only had one leg. The cowboy groaned in despair, but Kevin knew that he had to say what was necessary to keep the cowboy's spirits up. "'Of course I would!' exclaimed Moore in response to Kevin's offer to help him with his injured foot. "'Well, just lie still now and let me take a look at this poor messed-up foot,' Kevin replied as he examined the injury. His fingers were not as precise as usual, but eventually Moore's discolored and misshapen foot was revealed. Kevin's first glance made him move faster and scrutinize closer. Then he yelled with joy, "'Boy, it's better. There's no sign of gangrene. We'll save your leg.' "'I never feared I'd lose my leg. All I feared was that I'd be club-footed. Let me look,' replied Moore as he raised himself on his elbow. Kevin lifted the unsightly foot. "'My God, it's crooked!' cried Moore passionately. "'Kevin, it's healed. It'll stay that way always. I can't move it. Oh, but Buster Dillon's ruined me.' The hunter pushed him back with gentle hands. "'Wills, it could have been worse.' But I never gave up hope, replied Moore in poignant grief. I couldn't. But now, how can you look at that clubfoot and not swear? Well, well, boy, cussing won't do any good. Now just lay still and let me work. You've had a lot of good news this morning, so I think you can stand to hear a little bad news. What? Bad news? queried Moore with a start. I reckon. Now listen. The reason Daisy hasn't answered your note is that she's been sick in bed for three weeks. Oh, no! exclaimed the cowboy in amazement and distress. "'Yes, and I'm her doctor,' replied Kevin with pride. First off, they had Mrs. Andrews, and Daisy kept asking for me. She was out of her head, you know. And as soon as I took charge, she got better. "'Heavens, Daisy was ill, and you never told me,' cried Moore. "'I can't believe it. She's so healthy and strong. What ailed her, Bent?' "'Well, Mrs. Andrews said it was a nervous breakdown, and old Devon was afraid of consumption.' and Dylan Standish swore she was only shamming. The cowboy cursed violently. "'I ain't gonna tell you nothing if you keep cussing and acting like a fool,' Kevin protested. "'I'll be quiet,' Moore pleaded. "'Well, that fool Dylan is worse than you think, in my opinion. Now, Wills, the truth is that no one knows what's wrong with Daisy. But I do. She was under a lot of stress leading up to October 1st. And when the wedding day ended with old Devon knocking Dylan out and no marriage, Daisy was shocked.' After that, she was always tired and didn't eat right. When Dylan recovered from the punch, he went after Daisy harder than ever. She didn't tell me, but I saw it. She couldn't avoid him except by staying in her room, which she did a lot. Then, surprisingly, Dylan started acting decent. He even impressed Daisy and old Devon. But I could see through him. He was like a kid wanting a new toy, and he was crazy about Daisy. He's really in love with her, and he behaved himself for a while. It showed that he can control his temper and impulses. Old Devon changed his mind and set another wedding date. But then Daisy got sick and they didn't send for me right away. When I finally saw her and she grabbed me like she was drowning, I knew what was wrong with her. It was love. Love, Moore gasped, breathless. Yes, love for a lucky cowboy named Wils Moore. She was heartbroken and she would have died if it weren't for me. Don't think, Wils, that people can't die from a broken heart. They can and I know it. But all Daisy needed was me and I cured her madness and made her eat. Now she's doing much better, said Kevin. Kevin, I've believed in heaven since you came down to White Slides, burst out Moore with shining eyes. But tell me, what did you tell her? Well, my particular medicine first off was to whisper in her ear that she'd never have to marry Dylan Standish. And after that, I gave her daily doses of talk about you, replied Kevin. Pard, she still loves me, whispered Moore. Wills, hers is the kind of love that grows stronger with time, I know. Moore strained in his intensity of emotion, clenching his fists and gritting his teeth. "'Oh, God, this is hard on me,' he cried. "'I'm a man. I love that girl more than life. And to know she's suffering for love of me, for fear of that marriage being forced upon her, to know that while I lie here a helpless cripple, it's almost unbearable. "'Boy, you've got to mend now. We have the best of hope now for you, for her, for everything,' said Kevin. "'Kevin, I think I love you, too,' said the cowboy. You're saving me from madness. Somehow I have faith in you to do whatever you want. 
But how could you tell Daisy she'd never have to marry Buster Dillon? Because I know she never will, replied Kevin with his slow, gentle smile. You know that? Sure. How on earth can you prevent it? Standish will never give up planning that marriage for his son. Dylan will nag Daisy till she can't call her soul her own. Between them, they will wear her down. My friend, how can you prevent it? Wills, the fact is I haven't figured out how I'm going to save Daisy. But that's no matter. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I will do it. You can bet on me, Wills. You gotta have hope and faith to help you get better. Don't forget you're in more danger than Daisy, said Kevin. I'll bet my life and soul on you, replied Moore with fervor. By God, I'll be the man I could have been. I'll rise above despair. I'll even come to terms with being a cripple. Will you rise above hate, Wills? asked Kevin softly. Hate? Hate for whom? Dylan Standish, said Kevin. Moore's lean, pale face contracted. Partner, you wouldn't expect me to forgive him, would you? No, I don't reckon I would. But you don't have to hate him. I don't. And I have more reason than you could guess. Wills, hate is poison in the blood. It's worse for the person who feels it than for the person it's directed towards. I know. If you stop brooding over what Dylan did to you and realize that he's not to blame, you'll overcome your hate. Dylan Standish needs pity. He was ruined before he was even born. He never should have been born. I want you to understand that and stop hating him. Will you try? Kevin, are you afraid I'll kill him? whispered Moore. Yep, that's it. I'm afraid you might. And think about how hard it would be for Daisy. She and Dylan were raised like siblings. It would be hard on her. You see, Daisy has a powerful sense of duty towards old Devon. If you killed Dylan, it would likely kill the old man, and Daisy would suffer for the rest of her life. You couldn't cure her of that. You want her to be happy. I do, Kevin. I swear I'll never kill Buster Dylan, and for Daisy's sake, I'll try not to hate him. Well, that's great to hear. I'm glad you promised that, said Kevin. I'm going to head out and chop some wood, Kevin declared. We can't let the fire go out again. Hey, partner, Moore interrupted. I'll write another letter to Daisy. Hand me that blank book and my pencil, and take your time with the wood. Kevin grabbed his two-bladed axe and shovel and headed outside. The woodpile was buried under a mound of snow, but he didn't mind. He enjoyed the crisp air, the crackling frost under his feet, and the sweet smell of freshly cut wood. He swung the axe like a natural-born woodsman, splitting the logs into three-foot pieces and stacking them near the cabin door. After two hours of work, he decided he had enough wood for the day and headed back inside. Moore was too engrossed in his writing to notice Kevin's return. Are you writing a book, Wills? Kevin asked, amused by Moore's glowing face. Yeah, almost done now, if Daisy doesn't answer this, Moore replied. I'll have two letters to give her then, for I never gave her the first one, Kevin chuckled. Moore shook his head. You son of a gun, well, hurry along now. Here's a pole I fetched in. Keep the logs within reach so when the fire needs more wood you can roll them on without any trouble. I'll be back before dark, and if I can't convince Daisy to write to you, then I won't have a letter to bring, said Kevin. Pard, if you bring me a letter, I'll do as you say. I'll lie still, sleep, and endure anything, replied Moore. Uh-huh. Then I'll bring you one, responded Kevin as he placed the little book in his pocket. Goodbye for now, and think of the good news that comes with the snow. Goodbye, heaven-sent hell-bent Kevin. Your name isn't a joke anymore, it's the truth, called Moore. Kevin trudged through the deep snow, following his old tracks. As he walked, he felt comforted by his deep thoughts. He realized that if he could live his life over again, he would find happiness in other people's happiness. Upon arriving at his cabin, he began cleaning a path to the dog corral. The snow had drifted there, making the task difficult. Luckily, he had built an enclosed house for the hounds to winter in. The heavy snow would put an end to hunting for a while. However, the ranch had enough deer, bear, and elk meat all frozen solid to last for a while. Kevin knew that his winter tasks would include feeding the hounds and stock, chopping wood, and doing whatever chores came his way. The pack of hounds had decreased in number, but they were still a handful. Cain, Daisy's beloved dog, had become a prized possession. He lived in the house and always greeted Kevin with distrust and disdain. Cain would never forgive the hand that had hurt him. Samson, Jim, and Fox were all sharing Kevin's cabin, and they made sure to loudly announce his return. In the early afternoon, Kevin made his way down to the ranch house. 
The snow wasn't as deep there, thanks to the wind blowing it away in open spaces. As he approached, he could hear the sound of iron pounding in the blacksmith shop, horses galloping in the corrals, and cattle mooing around the hayricks in the barnyard. He knocked on Daisy's door, and she called out for him to come in. When he entered, he found her sitting up in bed, propped up by pillows and dressed in a warm, woolly dillonet or dressing gown. Her paleness was evident, and the shadows under her eyes made them look large and mournful. Ben, Kevin, you don't care for me any more, Daisy exclaimed reproachfully. Why not, lass? he asked. You were so long in coming, she replied, now with petulance. I guess now I don't want you at all. Well, then, I reckon that's the reward for people who worry and work for others, Kevin retorted. I guess I'll go back and not give you what I brought. He made a pretense of leaving and put a hand to his pocket as if to ensure the safety of some article. Daisy blushed and held out her hands. She was repentant of her words and curious about what he had brought. Why, Ben, Kevin, I count the minutes before you come, she said. What did you bring me? Who's been in here? he asked, going forward. That's a poor fire. I'll have to fix it. Mrs. Andrews just left. It was good of her to drive up. She came in the sled, she said. Oh, Ben, it's winter. There was snow on my bed when I woke up. I think I'm better today. Dylan hasn't been in here yet, Daisy said excitedly. At this, Kevin laughed, and Daisy followed suit. Well, you look a little sassy today, which I take as a good sign, said Kevin. I've got some news that will come near to making you well. Oh, tell it quick, she cried. Wills ain't gonna lose his leg, it's healing up just fine, said Kevin. And there was a letter from his old man apologizing for something he never told me. Daisy let out a sigh of relief and closed her eyes. Thank goodness, she whispered. And get this, Kevin continued. His old man wants him to come back home and take over the ranch. Daisy's eyes shot open in alarm. But he can't leave. He won't leave, will he? I don't think so, but someday he will and he'll take you with him. Kevin reassured her. Daisy covered her face with her hands and stayed quiet for a moment. Those prophecies of yours, she finally said, they always seem to come true. I wish I had more happy ones, Kevin replied, but all I get are those black croaking ones that come like ravens. Daisy changed the subject. I'm feeling better today, she said. What do you have for me, Ben? I want to talk to you first, Kevin said.